was that? I gonged. Okay, I'm gonna wait just a just a second. Can you hear me? It's waiting for a little bit. Oh, it's waiting. We'll check. Last time we had some technical difficulties. Okay, so we have a little bit of a delay in the, uh, in the live stream. So some of the comments will come in a little bit after we ask the questions, but, uh, or, or the, the questions that come in, we might be a little bit delayed, but that's okay. So today we're, we're doing another workshop that is specific to scoliosis and spinal deformities and things like that. We appreciate everyone that's tuned in today. And uh, hopefully you find it useful and we can go through some, some good stuff. So um, today what I want to do, I want to share a couple of stories from this month. Uh, we've had some amazing patients that we've seen. We've seen some cool, cool things, cool as a physical therapist, some interesting things with spinal deformities and scoliosis. So I want to talk a little bit about that. And I want to hopefully provide some good information for you who's watching and you in the clinic. Uh, to help you make good decisions on how to treat your scoliosis and your spine and, and what to do. There's so much information out there that it's hard to, to figure out what actually is, is going on. So and what is, is helpful and what isn't just uh, somebody saying that they treat it. So today I want to talk about a pamphlet that we have here in the clinic. We actually have it in a few uh, surgeons and pediatric offices as well. It's called the top six scoliosis questions. And so in this pamphlet, we talk about um, specific questions that we get here in the clinic from a lot of patients who, uh, usually it's patients' parents if they're adolescents, but we also get a lot of questions from uh, adults with scoliosis as well. So I wanted to talk about this pamphlet. It goes through a few different uh, questions that we answer in the pamphlet and we're going to go through some of those today. If you're here in Lehigh in Utah, stop in and grab one of the pamphlets. If you're not, on our website there is a, a way that you can, you can request this pamphlet, request the information. So we'll put that link in the chat. So I, Dawson's going to help us with that. He can put that link in the chat. And did it go, Doss? All right, so it went. So the link is in the chat. and. You can, you can go there and you can download this, this pamphlet yourself. It, we, we went a few months trying to develop this. We developed it with some surgeons and, and some other providers, and I think it's really helpful information. So I want to go over that a little bit today. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to share was a few different patients that I've seen lately that were kind of interesting, and, and I think those online and those here, there's, what's that? Yeah. Uh, those here in, in the clinic and the patients that we see, we see a lot of different types of patients. And so I wanted to talk about some of the patients that we see um, and give you an idea of what we treat because we treat a lot of different things. The first one, a lot of our patients are adolescents with scoliosis. And by adolescents, I mean teenagers age 10 to 18, and they... They have scoliosis, it's progressing, or it, it might progress, and so we treat it to try and stop the progression so they don't need bracing or don't need surgery. Not that I don't use bracing or I don't use surgery, but we try and stop it from progressing to where they need that. So I had a, I had a patient this week that I saw, and she has a, a mild curve, but she had a long time to grow. She was diagnosed at age 12 and she had her growth plates wide open and she was, she, it looks like she was going to be progressing. She was at 16 degrees and it would have been a progressive scoliosis the way it looked. She had a lot of growth spurts. And I saw her when she was 11, four years ago, and I saw her at 15 this week and her curve was staying at 15 degrees, hadn't progressed and she had she was done growing she was a risser five which means her growth plates are, are pretty much closed 
And it was really cool to see. I, I actually really like treating scoliosis because I get to follow these patients for a long time. I get to get to know them for years. Uh, it's not something that's the norm in physical therapy. And so I, I, really, I really like that. And to see her scoliosis not progress, it had progressed up into the 20s and then we were able to, to reduce it back into the teens. It was really cool for me because it, it was a success and we were able to see that that the fruits of her labors because she was the one doing all the work I was just teaching her how to do it and so that was that was one cool experience another experience with adults I've seen a lot of adults post-surgery lately and like I said I'm not anti-surgery in any way but post-surgery provide I mean that provides stability to the spine so it's not progressing but it also can create some issues with lack of mobility things have things are changed yeah, orientation of the spine and the muscles and trying to to strengthen the muscles is kind of a challenge and so we work on trying to get stability and trying to reduce pain and I've seen a lot of post-operative uh, adult patients lately which is is interesting it's actually one of my favorite populations to treat because those patients are ones that can really benefit from from uh, hands-on treatment and they can benefit from still the Schroth method and other scoliosis specific exercise so that that's actually becoming one of my favorite things to treat uh, the more I think about it because we can make a huge impact um, and then t today actually I won't mention who it was but I saw a patient today who was post-surgical adolescent with kyphosis she had scoliosis, not scoliosis, surgical correction of kyphosis where they fused the thoracic spine to reduce the kyphosis. And she had hypersensitivity in her back because of where the scars are and because they cut through nerves and things like that. Having trouble sitting at school because she gets really fatigued because she doesn't really have any muscle mass in the spine at this point. So that one was very rewarding because we're seeing things change we're seeing that her endurance is longer she can sit through school better her hypersensitivity is less and all those things really really help to to change someone's life so those are some interesting ones we've seen a lot of scoliosis patients and kyphosis patients this week and those are just uh, you know a few highlights i think in in future workshops we'll go over that in the beginning and we'll talk about some successes and some things that we're seeing that are that are new and different. I think one one thing that is interesting is we're seeing uh, some more VBT surgeries and I'll, I'll go over what VBT is today and it's vertebral body tethering and we will talk about what that means what it is and and who could benefit from that whether you're a candidate for that or not. So if we go through the pamphlet I'm going to steal the pamphlet back and if we go through the pamphlet, uh, we have, I'm just going to go through some of, the, some of the questions. Some of them we answered last month. Uh, the first question is, what is scoliosis? And scoliosis is a, a curve that goes side to side in the spine. And it's not a natural curve in the spine. And if it's over 10 degrees, then we call it scoliosis. It's kind of a simplistic view of scoliosis. And so that's not um, totally all that scoliosis is but it gives you an idea. So if you're looking at someone from the back, we should see the spine go straight. We, with scoliosis, we see that the spine curves. Let's talk about kyphosis a little bit. Kyphosis is from the side if we have an excessive curve in the upper back or lower back that is out of the normal range, then that's kyphosis. This isn't the bad posture that teenagers have when they're on their Xbox. Okay, Dawson just sat up a little bit straighter. Um, it's it's a structural thing. Schuerman's kyphosis is the main one we're talking about, and that's a rounding of the upper back because of degenerative changes in the spine. So that's uh, that's kyphosis. So that's what what those are in the pamphlet. It doesn't talk about kyphosis, but I thought I'd mention it anyway. Uh, what what causes scoliosis? Scoliosis most of the time is is idiopathic, meaning we don't know the cause of scoliosis. And because we don't know the cause of it, we can't fix it necessarily. And so we are left with dealing with the scoliosis 
trying to adjust for things so that it doesn't progress. And maybe one day we'll know scoliosis, what causes it. There is a high genetic component in most families that have scoliosis, not all. And so genetics can play into that as well. But we don't know exactly what causes scoliosis in adolescents that have idiopathic scoliosis. In patients who have neurological scoliosis, we know what causes that. It's a nerve problem. In adults with degenerative scoliosis, which is actually way more common than I thought it was, uh, that can be 10 to 30 percent of the population once we get into the adult stages. Uh, that can be caused by degeneration more on one side of the spine than the other. So we start to see the spine curve. So we do know the cause in some things, but we don't know it in the classic idiopathic scoliosis. So how is scoliosis diagnosed? I think I'm going to leave that question for, uh, for next month. We're, we're, we'll talk a lot about a scoliosis diagnosis and how we diagnose for that. Um, but one of the questions on here is, does everyone with scoliosis need to have a brace or surgery? And the answer to that is no. If it's a mild scoliosis curve, less than 25 degrees, you don't need bracing if you're an adolescent. If you're an adult, even if you're over 25, you don't necessarily need a brace. I don't usually brace in adults. And not everyone needs surgery. If you're an adolescent that progresses past 45, yeah, you'll probably be looking at surgery, but um, adults, I've seen adults with 85, 90 degree curves that are not having surgery and are, are focusing on scoliosis specific exercise. So that's some of the pamphlet. The last part of it talks about how do we treat scoliosis. So that's what I want to, I want to talk about a little bit more. I want to draw a little, little picture here. Hopefully, hopefully you can see it. Here, let me move this a little bit. We still see that, Doss? <laughs> right, there's a little bit of a lag. So with scoliosis, when I draw scoliosis, I usually will use very simple, simple drawings. So I use a circle for the head, and then we have a, a scoliosis curve can go any direction, left, right. It can be in the thoracic. It can be in the, in the lumbar. It can be in the thoracal lumbar, but a classic curve is the spine going down, curving to the right. If we can't see that, maybe I'll use. Right, let's let's move this closer. Let's see if this works. Whoa. So we have the head, we have the oh the glare of the light. <laughs> darker marker if we make these bigger I don't know if that helps if we shadow it a little bit we'll have to figure out that for future future videos but this is how I usually will draw the scoliosis curve um, so we have usually the pelvis is actually imbalanced so it's shifted to the side and this is the back of this person so I'm going to give them some hair but we have the pelvis shifted to the side. It can be shifted to the other side if we had a lumbar curve. But in this drawing, it's not. And so we see these differences in the spine. We see asymmetries. So it's asymmetrical to one side or the other. And uh, to treat the scoliosis, we have to address those. If we look at someone from the side, I'll make this a little darker. So here's the head. I got a lot of hair. And we, well, this is from the side, so they shouldn't have hair over here. Here's their nose. There we go. If we look at a scoliosis patient, a lot of times they will have less of a kyphosis, but they'll still have a lordosis before their pelvis. So it's flatter through this area of the spine than it normally would be. In kyphosis, like Schuerman's kyphosis, we would see that that is increased like that. Here's the hair. Beautiful picture. So there we have an increase in kyphosis, but scoliosis has 
that flat back, that flatter part of the upper back. And we also have a rotation. So um, naturally, with the, the curve going to the right, we would have a rotation backward on the right side and forward on the left side. So the biggest thing I want you to take away from this is that scoliosis is a three-dimensional problem. It's three-dimensional, so we have to treat it in a three-dimensional way. If we don't treat it in a three-dimensional way, then we're not really addressing the scoliosis. So that is just a little bit of information on, on how, that will kind of give us some background on how to treat it. So with scoliosis, we treat it from all three directions, three dimensions. So we have to treat the rotation. A lot of times with scoliosis, you'll see a, what we would call a rib hump or a prominence on the back. So that is something that we have to address. We have to address the flattening of the thoracic spine. We have to address the curve itself that goes side to side. And with, with a lot of treatment techniques, we have to, have to look at those. So if we talk about how we treat this, um, physical therapy is in there and scoliosis specific exercise is in there. And that includes the Schroth method, the C's approach, and a few other methods. And we, tr we have to address all three dimensions. When I was in, in physical therapy school, the, it was a long time ago, but it's still taught this way. It's taught that you treat by strengthening the convexity, so the side of the curve that's opposite the cave, so the convexity, and you stretch the concavity to open up the concavity. Um, it's a very simplistic view of how to treat scoliosis, and it doesn't address the rotation it doesn't address the hypokyphosis that happens. And so it's still taught that way in physical therapy schools. I, don't, I haven't met a student where they teach them in a different way. And it's not the fault of the physical therapy schools because that, most of those students are not going to go out to treat scoliosis. And so they're not going way in depth in scoliosis treatment. But I mention that because I have uh, patients who have insurances that we're not in network with that that I won't say, uh, maybe I should say, I don't know, but I won't say today, um, that tell their patients that anyone can treat scoliosis, any physical therapist can treat scoliosis. While that is true, it's under our license and under our practice, our practice act that we can treat spine and scoliosis. The difference is should, should any physical therapist treat scoliosis? It's, to me, it's similar to a general practitioner physician versus a cardiologist. If you have a heart problem, your general practice doc can, can pick up on it and can maybe do some things with it. But if you really have a significant problem with your heart, you're going to go to a cardiologist. Uh, and of course, that's what I do for a living, so I'm a little bit biased. But the research also supports that physical therapy generalized that isn't specific to, to a specific school of thought in scoliosis treatment doesn't have any effect on progression of the curve. And that, that was a big, a big study that came out that, that showed that that was the case. So we have to keep in mind that PSSE, which is, um, <laughs> every time we do this, a robot vacuum goes off and starts to clean. <laughs> Yeah, Dion, if you could just turn it up. Just hit dock. Gotta love them, but comes at a, at a weird time. I'm going to have to remember that next month. Um, so keep in mind that when you are looking for someone to treat your scoliosis, the evidence supports that if they're trained in a specific method of treating scoliosis, it can be effective. But generalized physical therapy unfortunately isn't effective on the curve. So that's, sorry, that's a little soapbox of mine. I kind of got, got sidetracked on that. But uh, scoliosis specific exercise is the lower level of treating scoliosis. Um, I shouldn't say lower, like not as important, but lower conservative. We can strengthen, we can improve posture, we can improve balance without doing something that is uh, quote unquote irreversible or, or harmful. And 
So that's our first line of attack with those mild curves. Even with moderate and severe curves, we use those as, as uh, treatment. The next level is bracing. I get a lot of questions about adults and bracing and whether adults We'll wait for it. I don't know if you can hear it because it's coming through the microphone, but but man. Okay, now that it's done doing its job. Um, so <laughs> I get a lot of questions on adults, whether bracing is appropriate for adults. And uh, in my experience, bracing, because adults aren't growing, bracing isn't as effective. I have used it a couple of times when someone just has no ability to control and stabilize their spine. But uh, for the most part, I don't use bracing with adults. With adolescents, there's a great study, the braced study. It's been talked about a lot in online and, and everywhere else. They talk about uh, using bracing for scoliosis and in adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, and it is effective. but but you have to wear uh, the brace for it to be effective. Dawson just said I'm making stuff up, but this is, these are real words, Dawson, real words. Uh, so bracing is helpful. It has to be worn, the brace has to be worn for a specific amount of time. If you wear it less than, like if you're only wearing it eight hours a day, it's not really effective and, and what's the point? But if you're wearing it 16, 18, sometimes even 20 hours a day, it sucks. I'll give you that. But it definitely is helpful, and it can stop progression of that curve. But again, that's in adolescence. That's not in adults. So the next level is surgery. Surgery is a way to treat scoliosis. And I do have adult patients, and I have adolescent patients that have surgery for scoliosis. And it is effective in stopping progression of the curve. And with that, the, sp the spine is usually fused. So um, with, with that, let's see what color will show up here. Dawson says yellow. I don't think yellow is going to show up. Turned like. OK. So usually rods are, yeah, these are all, the neon markers do not show up well. But rods are put along the spine to stop progression of, of the curve and to stabilize it. That's the way that it's done. They put screws into the vertebrae um, to keep it from going anywhere. And then that stops progression of the scoliosis curve. So that's historically how we've used uh, scoliosis correction surgery to stop progression of the curve. Um, Dawson, is that a question that we want to ask now, or? Uh, how about treating elderly? Uh, how about treating elderly dealing with scoliosis? How about treating elderly dealing with scoliosis? So th the surgery is very similar for that. Physical therapy, like scoliosis-specific exercise, is very similar for that, but bracing is something that we don't usually use for that. So we might get back to that question. Um, so historically, fusion is the way that that. Oh. Okay. So um, the question is if they're. There are hardly any preventative measures to stop someone from progressing to needing surgery for older older people. Um, I, and I, for the most part, I would probably agree with that. Uh, th not that there isn't, but they're not used very often. I think the, the biggest thing is that people, well, medical professionals usually think of surgery as the fix for it. And... There's so much more that we can do before that. We talked about that last month, and there's so much more that we can do before surgery. I have patients with huge curves that we're, we are keeping in check with scoliosis-specific exercise, and I think it's unfortunate when we jump to surgery without trying those conservative things. So let, let's 
I'm going to answer some other questions in just a minute, but we're going to move on just a little bit because there are some other surgical techniques out there to treat scoliosis. Um, there, one that is kind of new and, uh, well, not new, it's been used for a little while, but got FDA approval, I think, last year or the year before, is called vertebral body tethering. Vertebral body tethering is, is pretty cool, actually, and I, I actually have sent some patients to receive vertebral body tethering. So let me describe what it is. I don't know, can you guys see this very well? We can see it okay? Okay. So if, if I have a scoliosis curve, I'm going to draw this here. And here's a vertebrae, here's a vertebrae, here's one, here's one, here's one. Okay, so this could be a lumbar or a thoracic curve. In vertebral body tethering, we actually have anchors that are placed into the vertebrae. Can you see that okay? Yeah. So anchors are put into the vertebrae on the convex side of the curve, so this side of the curve. And then tethers are placed between the two, kind of like ropes, kind of like uh, just a, a rope, a cable to, to tether it together. This works only in adolescents that are still growing. So then as the child grows, this side the growth can't happen, but on this side, the growth does happen, and so the concave side expands and grows, but the convex side can't because it's being held by the tethers. And so the growth that before was the enemy of, of scoliosis treatment because it causes progression, all of a sudden becomes the friend of scoliosis treatment because they can grow out of it where their spine is growing and going out of the scoliosis curve. It doesn't fix the scoliosis. This doesn't um, take it away, but it lessens the degree of the scoliosis. I have a few patients right now who have had VBT, and they're doing fantastic. The problems with VBT in the past have been sometimes those tethers will break. Sometimes it's not the right candidate for, for uh, VBT, and they don't get a good result. So VBT has to be in someone who is still growing. It has to be in someone who um, you know, has enough time to grow for that correction to take place. And they have to, have to be young enough. Um, there are a few places that are looking at doing that in adults, but it doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you think of it as a growth thing, uh, that you need that growth. So I had another question. So the question is, they have a severe upper curve in the upper thoracic, and they're wondering, could a chiropractor fix the upper thoracic curve? Um, how, do, how do I put this the right way? They can't. They, they can't correct, they can't fix that upper curve because that curve is a structural problem. This person is how old? Did they say? They didn't say how old. So there's no evidence, none, no evidence to support that chiropractic can fix and take away scoliosis. I don't mean to, to sound like I'm, you know, dogging on the chiropractors, but there's no evidence for it. And, and we see that a lot where some of my patients have been seen in chiropractic and have been told that the curve will be fixed. The problem is it, it can't. 47. 47 years old. You're going to have scoliosis the rest of your life. <clears throat> there's nothing that fixes that curve. But it doesn't mean it can't be helped, but we can't fix it. So even most of the chiropractors that I, that I know and I work with will, will totally agree with that. So if you have someone that will tell you that they are going to fix your scoliosis, find somebody else. They're, uh, they're selling snake oil. So, yeah, I'm pretty blunt with that, but I, that's something that I really, uh, um, I don't like when people are told things that aren't true. So, uh, okay, so that's VBT. So VBT, vertebral body tethering. 
that's how that surgery is done. There are some other surgeries that aren't actually done anymore that were to, to staple the growth plates in the vertebrae to kind of do a same thing, the same thing. In really young kids, there's a surgery that's a really cool surgery. It's called a magic rod surgery. And it's using magnets to, so they, they implant the magnets in the spine and then they can, they can expand the surgery, the, the hardware in the spine as the child grows. Because that's a problem with fusing the spine at a young age. The body's still gonna grow, but then if you fuse the spine, that's not gonna grow. So the magic rods grow with them. That's a really cool thing, but that's not an adolescence or anything like that. So there, there are many surgical options, and my, what I'm thinking is, in the future, we'll probably see, um, we'll probably see some, some advancements in scoliosis surgeries where fusion becomes less likely, and fusion becomes less done because we have better options. The problem with VBT is you have to catch it in time to to correct for the curve. So, uh, great question. Um, <clears throat> so as far as treatment goes, I didn't get into chiropractic because, um, to be honest, there's just not enough research. And there's not enough research to support that chiropractic changes it. It's too passive. It's a passive approach to something that we need to retrain the muscles, how to hold the spine in a different position. I do know a fair number of chiropractors that are trained in the C's approach, the, the scientific exercise approach to scoliosis. And that's something that I'm certified in as well. And if it's not a specific method that's been researched, I have a really hard time getting behind that. So um, on our website, you can also find, maybe Dawson can find on our website, the research page and post a link for that. Uh, we have a lot of research that we review. We're a little behind on that. There's some research that came out in the past few months that we haven't put on there <clears throat> that is supportive of the techniques that we do, but also we, uh, we, we try to make sure everything we do is, is backed by research. So, scoli scoli sorry, my voice is cracking. <laughs> I'm losing my voice. Um, so if you go to our website, aligntherapyutah.com, and you go to resources, under resources, there's a, um, a page that is specific to research. And we go through and we kind of, um, we review that research for strengths and weaknesses. So check that out if you have, have questions on that. I'm a firm believer that anything you do for any problem, not just scoliosis, there should be research behind it. And if there's not, the big question is why not? Is it? actually not backed by research. Any other questions that were on the on the website? Okay, awesome. There's what? There's a lag. Okay, so we're okay. So today in the description for the, the live uh, video, this isn't cutting my head off, is it? Okay, <laughs> good. Um, I talked about three things. We we're going to share three things that you could do to reduce the, the scoliosis or reduce the pain that you're having with it that you can do today. So I want to I want to go through a few things for that. So the first thing, um, the first thing is being aware of your posture. So I I'm going to turn the camera here and I'm going to show you Dawson, my son. <laughs> so there's Dawson, and so being aware of you signed up for this because you were born into my family. Being aware of your posture is what I'm talking about, is making sure you're aware of what's happening with your posture. So if we, if we go to the side with Dawson here, so I want you to sit how you normally do. Or slouch. Look at your phone. Okay. So we notice that his posture goes forward. We notice his head goes forward, but his head usually tips back to keep his eyes up on his phone or his laptop or whatever. And so that causes tension through the whole system down the spine. So if we think about Dawson's head as a bowling ball, he's loving this by the way. Um, if we think of his head as a bowling ball, the further forward the bowling ball gets, 
the more strain it puts on the muscles down the back and in the neck. So it's the same thing with the muscles of the back. The further forward your posture, <laughs> I think you fell asleep. Um, the further forward the, uh, the head and the body gets, the more tension we have on the, uh, on the muscles. So if we're talking about scoliosis, pain from scoliosis, um, usually that pain comes from what we call the sagittal imbalance or the forward position. So being aware of your posture, making sure that your, the, the bowling ball is sitting over the spine instead of being slouched forward and just hanging on those muscles. So that's number one, be mindful of your posture. The other thing we see with scoliosis though is that the pelvis is usually imbalanced to one side or the other. So when you are standing, brushing your teeth, when you're uh, doing other things where you can be aware of it in a mirror, making sure that your pelvis is centered underneath you is, is a really, uh, really helpful thing as well. So that we're centered, that's how our body is designed to be. The weight for our head and our body should be centered over the spine and over the, the pelvis to support us. So number one is be mindful of your posture. You've probably been told this by your, your mom or your grandma or, or somebody else, but be mindful of your posture. At first, it might feel like the muscles hurt and are getting fatigued because of that posture, but it's probably because you haven't been in that posture a ton. So it needs, the muscles need to, to get stronger. And, and yeah, the more they get endurance, the, the less painful it will be and the more you're, you'll be able to keep that. So that's number one, be mindful of your posture. We'll go over that more. We have other videos on our, on our YouTube channel that go over posture, uh, so check those out as well. Number two, breathing. Taking deep breaths really helps. So, so those that are here and those on YouTube, <clears throat> put one hand on your stomach and one hand on your chest and take a deep breath. Take a few of them. So I want you to pay attention as you breathe in what moves more? Does your stomach move more or does your, your chest hand move more? For most people, the chest hand moves more because they're breathing like, let's see if I can get a little closer. They're breathing like this, where the chest raises and falls and the stomach sometimes will actually go in. So with that, that, the reason I have you do that is you can tell if that's using your diaphragm or not. If you're using your chest hand to breathe, if you're using your chest, that's not using your diaphragm. The diaphragm sits in the body like this, and as you breathe in, it pushes down, and it should push your stomach out as you breathe in. Your chest shouldn't, well, I probably hit the mic. Um, your chest shouldn't rise and fall as much as your stomach coming in and out. Uh, so here, here's something you can try. Hand on your chest, hand on your stomach, and breathe in and have your stomach hand come out and try to not move your chest hand. So if we're looking at it like this, my chest hand stays stable, I breathe in, I breathe out, I breathe in. So I'm breathing down into my, into my belly, into my stomach. The reason I talk about breathing is the, the more we can breathe with the diaphragm, the more elongation we can get out of the spine. As we breathe in, we, can, we can't really necessarily get taller a ton, but we can really increase the expansion that, that we can get going up. So a lot of times, a lot of tension is happening because of back pain, neck pain, whatever, whatever else pain we have. So if we can breathe with the diaphragm, it's been shown to reduce the tension in those muscles. So hopefully you've been able to practice that. Breathing is a huge part of scoliosis specific exercise, especially the Schroth method. We do a lot of breathing, we do a lot of expansion, and being able to direct that breathing and that expansion to those different areas is really important. So breathe for pain relief and breathe for good posture and elongation. It helps to keep those muscles active. Uh, so number, what are we on, number three. So number three is, I want, I want you to strengthen and support the core muscles. So 
the, one of the core muscles that you hear about a lot in physical therapy and, and other rehab is the transverse abdominis. Uh, the transverse abdominis is a deep core muscle that you can find, and we'll take questions after I talk about this. I know there's a question that's, that's lingering. Um, if you push on your, your hip bones that are right in the front, and so everybody find their hip bones right in the front. So I'm not talking about your, your hip bone up here. I'm talking about those little, little bones on the front of your, your hips. Then fall to the inside a little bit. And I mean, go to the inside of those bones and fall into the muscle. And you're right over that transverse abdominis muscle. So now if you just tighten your stomach just a little bit, you should be able to feel those muscles tighten under your fingers. If you can feel those muscles tighten under your fingers, now check and see if you're breathing. If you're still breathing without labored breathing, then we're focusing on stabilizing that transverse abdominis. It goes all the way around to the back. It's kind of like a weightlifter's belt or a corset or something like that that adds stability to the, the low back. And that's why we talk about abdominal strengthening for, for core strengthening because that goes all the way around. You can do that exercise with anything. You can be sitting in your chair at home. You can be sitting here in the clinic. You can be standing. You can be laying on your back. It's easier laying on your back to learn, but trying to use that during the day. If you go to pick something up, pick up your 10-pound dog, add a little bit of stability to the spine before you pick that up. Uh, so those are the three things that can help. You may notice that I didn't do anything really specific to scoliosis. And that's because every scoliosis curve is different. I, if we want to go specific into a right thoracic curve, what do we do for that? We could do that, but it, it may not be the right thing for you. And so we're not gonna go into those specific things. These are great for spine health with anyone with back pain, but with scoliosis, posture is even more important. Uh, so these three things, um, sitting, sitting tall with posture, um, activating the transverse abdominis, and breathing in with the diaphragm, and doing those daily can help you to have better spine health. So if you have pain with them, back off. You may not be doing them right, or they might not, may not be right for you. And check with a, a physical therapist who's specialized in scoliosis to, to do that. Um, do we have a question that If the right leg is shorter? Yeah. Um, so this is probably a topic for another month, but if the right leg is shorter, it's going to tip the pelvis to the left, which is going, it's going to be more likely that a right lumbar curve is going to form. So the convexity on the right side, concavity on the left, because the, the pelvis is shifted and pushed up on the left side. So it can affect the thoracic, but it doesn't have to. And so if someone has a leg length difference, we can predict lumbar. Sometimes we can predict thoracic, but it's not quite as cut and dry as if the right's shorter, then you will have a curve here or here. So yeah, we, we can get a little bit more into that um, in, at another time, because I would need to explain a little bit more about where we're going with that. But leg length differences can definitely create a scoliosis curve. And with all of my patients, whether adults or adolescents, we screen for a leg length difference to, uh, to determine whether that's playing into to the, the scoliosis. Because if there is a leg length difference and we don't address that, then we don't get as good of a correction as we could otherwise. Okay, hanging upside down. I actually get this question a bit, like inversion tables and things like that. Um, the problem with inversion tables is they are passive, meaning there's no muscle activation really happening. And so if we're looking to correct and retrain the body how to hold the spine in a better position, the inversion tables don't really, don't really work. You need the muscles to control and correct for the spine. So if you're having back pain and you do an inversion table, that can be helpful. 
as, as that elongates the spine. But as far as stopping progression of the curve, we need the muscles involved. And so it, it doesn't usually work quite as well. Side planks, there was a, dare I say, a bad research article that was published a little while ago about side planks. It showed that if you did side planks on one side, mainly the, the convex side, so you do side planks on the right side in this example, um, that if you did that once a day and you held it for as long as you could once a day, that the curve would reduce by like 50%. The problem is that study was not a good study. And that does not work to do side planks on one side. The problem also is most people have two curves. Which side is the convex side when we have two curves? It's both sides. And so what do we do with that? They tried to talk about that in the study, but it's not a, a repeatable study. And side planks are a great exercise. I use those with my, my patients all the time, but it's not something that will correct the spine. It's great for reducing pain and increasing strength though. Any other questions? Okay, so I know you may not agree with me on all of my, my, uh, my recommendations, suggestions, and explanations, but... Um, with a specific brace? With a specifically designed brace, exercise with a specifically designed brace for your particular scoliosis. So the comment was you should exercise with a brace specifically designed for your curve and your scoliosis. Um, I agree with the brace needs to be specific to your curve and your scoliosis. That is definitely the case. Um, some of the ones just off the shelf, um, they don't, they're not specific enough. So I totally agree with that. I usually don't have my patients exercise in the brace for a couple of reasons. One is I want more muscle activation than the brace will allow. And I also want them to learn how to get into those positions without the brace forcing them into those positions. We do in the Schroth method, we do in brace corrections. So we do in brace exercises where we're trying to correct within what the brace is trying to do, and those are really helpful. But as far as doing like side planks while you're in a brace, uh, it's way uncomfortable to begin with, especially hard braces, and it's not something that I recommend. So doing exercises out of the brace and then reinforcing the brace when you're in the brace. And that's for adolescents. I don't usually brace adults. So good questions. Um, okay. So just a, another little plug, if you're, if you're looking for um, more information on scoliosis, this pamphlet, you can, you can download that. Uh, go to our website, aligntherapyutah.com, and you can download this as, long, as well as some other information that's specific to scoliosis and other, other spine treatments. Um, if you're looking for ways to reduce your back pain that are more passive, one of my favorite little gadgets, I'll just do a plug for this, um, since it is near Christmas time when we're doing this live. Uh, this is the, the Hypersphere Mini from Hyperice. And this is one of my favorite things to take when I am going on a car trip or I'm going on a plane um, because I have sciatica. I don't have scoliosis, but I have sciatica. And I can take this little guy and it vibrates, so it has three different settings. You can probably hear it. Um, three different settings, and when my back starts to hurt or my hip starts to hurt because of my sciatica, I'll turn that on. I'll stick it right back where the problem is, and I can keep driving because it's just sitting right there on a plane. I can put it in my, in my back and just lean up against the, the seat and get that to massage it. If my wife's neck is hurting, I can reach over and roll this on her neck and back, and it helps too. One of my favorite little travel gadgets. So if you're looking for a cool gift idea, that's it. Um, so I think that's, that's all the time we have tonight. Um, we'll do this again in January, the second Wednesday in January, which is what day? Can you look that up real quick? Second Wednesday in January. What's the date for that? We'll do another YouTube live. We'll do another in, in the clinic. The 11th, January 11th 
is our day for our next scoliosis and spine workshop. And we will go over any other questions. We might talk a little bit more about leg length differences. I think that'd be a good topic and maybe different braces and things like that. So if you have any questions that you would like answered, you can put them in the comments below on, on YouTube and we'll try to answer those next time. Uh, otherwise, if you have more questions, browse our other videos. We have plenty of videos uh, that you can look at with scoliosis as well as other orthopedic problems and things like that. And don't forget to subscribe. You'll get, um, you know, when we do things live and when we add videos, you'll be able to see those. So I appreciate everyone online and everyone here in the clinic for showing up and hopefully it was helpful. And keep those, keep those backs strong, straight, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see you next time. Thanks.